So you're a photographer, you already have your camera buddy, our camera buddies, and they're awesome. And you've spent years accumulating all of that glass, all of those lenses, and you spent thousands of dollars on that. And now you want to try your hand at astrophotography. Well, I have a few things you should know before going down that path. Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about transitioning from photography into astrophotography and what you should know before you do that. Because as a photographer, you've likely already tried to put your camera on a tripod, taken like awesome pictures of the Milky Way with a super cool foreground as well. And you've learned about the 500 rule and about all of those other rules. And you're thinking like, hey, maybe I could go further. And you looked at some pictures taken by amateurs on the internet and also the Hubble telescope and like maybe you want to take pictures of nebulae like the great Orion Nebula or uh, the Pleiades or other star clusters or, or the Andromeda galaxy, all of those super cool objects that are really difficult to take in pictures. So you're thinking maybe like, hey, let's get a star tracker because you know the Earth rotates, which means that especially at high focal length, the uh, uh, stars that you're trying to take, they're like moving in your frame. So you need to actually freeze them by tracking them using a star tracker. So you could plop your camera on the star tracker and, uh, and get started. It's not quite as simple as that. Well, it is, but it isn't. Let's go into it. At number five, you might be surprised about the terminology that is used in astrophotography versus uh, normal photography. And there are a lot of terms uh, that are the same between uh, the two hobbies, like dynamic range or shot noise, that kind of stuff. And there are terms that are very, that, that mean the same thing, we just call them differently. So pixel shift and super resolution, for instance, will be transferred to dithering and drizzling in astrophotography, and especially dithering is super important. And things like ISO, we keep using it as in astrophotography for people using DSLRs for astrophotography, but for people with dedicated astro cameras, they typically talk about gain. And ISO and gain, essentially, they're very similar in that they're linked to another measure called the read noise that becomes super important for astrophotography. And there's other things like you have uh, long exposure noise reduction in most uh, cameras available, except that for astrophotography, we'll, we call it dark calibration and we have better methods of doing that uh, than what the camera does with long exposure noise reduction. Uh, lots of terms like that that are slightly different or completely different, uh, but they kind of mean the same thing. But there's one term in particular that uh, is always interesting about photography, which is the term aperture. Um, and aperture is, in photography I often hear like I'm going to lower the aperture because I'm shooting at night and I need to get more light onto my sensor, for instance. But when you're, you're referring to aperture in that way, you really mean the focal ratio, which is a measure that we use in astrophotography all of the time as well. And we will want to get the lowest focal ratio possible in astrophotography as well, except that aperture, we never call the focal ratio aperture. We call the aperture the actual diameter of the objective lens that is in this telescope, for, for instance. Or if it's a mirror-based telescope, it will be the diameter of the primary mirror or the effective diameter of the primary mirror uh, at that we call the aperture. And the larger the aperture, the more light is gathered by the system. Um, so uh, we never talk about lowering the aperture as something that is inherently good in terms of light gathering capabilities. So yeah, aperture, it's the diameter of the objective lens. Uh, focal ratio is what we really refer to when we want to uh, talk about the light gathering ability of our um, uh, telescope, our lens. Another thing that's very interesting about photography is uh, the focal length of lenses can be expressed differently, especially when you're talking about like a 35 millimeter equivalent focal length. We don't have that concept in astrophotography at all. The lens, our telescope, will be talking about its focal length as the actual physical optical definition of the term focal length. Like if you have parallel rays entering your lens or telescope, how far, be, how, how far away beyond that lens do they actual, actually come together and focus at a point? I'm simplifying a bit here, but that's pretty much it. So there's no 35 millimeter equivalent, there's no crop factors, there's nothing like that. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about sensor size in terms of, and focal length in terms of 
uh, field of view in terms of how they affect the focal ratio, but we're not talking about crop factors, all this kind of stuff. And similarly, we almost never talk about f-stops or t-stops in astrophotography, where we are very into focal ratios, but because telescopes has very, have very varied focal ratios like f10, f7, f5, uh, f4.9, f4.3, f4 uh, f7.7 depending on the optical system that you're using it's a lot of different numbers and there's no direct relationship like oh this is one stop above that one no <laughs> so we don't really use f-stops except like when it's convenient to do so so there are some telescopes with f4 and some telescopes with f2 and and then yeah we can use uh, f-stops to just compare them together but yeah there is a lot of terminology you might see it's crawling on the screen right now that is used in this hobby and it's because it's a complicated hobby that reuses a lot of photography and then adds more complexity, more challenges and more techniques to overcome those challenges on top. At number four, and this is a really important point about astrophotography, is that uh, the um, sickness of wanting to buy new equipment is very, very real, and it's a real black hole, perhaps even more than photography. And you might think that with your super awesome, super expensive lenses that you have right now, and your super awesome camera bodies, you're set for a long time. And for some people, that's true. But for a lot of people, you will very soon be wanting more. Because when you take astrophotos, um, you're taking pictures of star fields uh, effectively and star fields are the most difficult test for a lens um, any defect any aberration that the lens has will be revealed on your star field pictures and you'll be very surprised to see how mediocre a lot of very expensive lenses are and this is why we have telescopes that are specialized at focusing at infinity because they really get uh, all of the stars nice and round all across the frames of a certain uh, size of sensor. And, and that's why you may want, in the end, to buy a telescope or several telescopes, why not? <laughs> because of their superior performance in terms of image quality to even very expensive lenses uh, that are used for normal photography. Uh, even though the telescopes are typically slower, so this thing is f3.8, uh, despite being so huge here, that's because it has an aperture of 20 centimeters and a focal length of 780 millimeters. So it's, it zooms in a lot. That's why it needs to be big to have such a low focal ratio, but compared to like an F2 lens, eh, or F1.8, or F1.4 F1 lens, eh, it's a bit lacking, right? But it doesn't stop at your lens, your camera also, you'll want something new very soon because there are astrophotography dedicated cameras and the main difference with a normal DSLR is that the sensor is cooled. For example, this red thing here is an astrophotography camera. I typically image with this at, with the sensor temperature set to minus 5 degrees Celsius or minus 10 degrees Celsius. So the sensor temperature is actually below freezing and this is to avoid thermal noise because we're taking long exposures and we want as little as possible of thermal noise that are that is really difficult to deal with in the end, especially if you're imaging like in summer with a DSLR that's uncooled. And also this camera, not only does it not get thermal noise because it's cooled, but it's also a mono monochrome camera. In normal photography, monochrome cameras are typically very expensive and like it's Leica or whatever and uh, therefore a very specific type of photography. In astrophotography, they, they're really often found and that's because you can isolate band passes or colors uh, that you want to capture from the astronomical objects. But then like the monochrome camera is expensive and then this black thing is a filter wheel. It has very expensive filters in there uh, with just the seven pieces of glass that I have in here is probably north of $2,000. So yeah, it's not cheap and the black hole is real and be careful not to fall too, too far within the event horizon of that black hole. At number three, uh, you really need to realize that astrophotography is a very challenging, very hard hobby, especially for deep space astrophotography. There are so many things that can go wrong and the error tolerance is minuscule. Just getting the proper focus on your stars 
will be very difficult and we're talking about microns in terms of precision of the focusing that you need and there are other challenges like it's surprisingly difficult to start to track stars accurately you'll be finding yourself having like subframes or exposures with trailing stars and you might think well that's fine I'll just take it but if you see trailing stars it means that the nebula or whatever you're trying to capture has also been blurred and when you're doing deep sky astrophotography, you're uh, trying to get as much signal to noise ratio as possible. And if you've blurred the image, you've lowered the signal to noise ratio contribution that that image can do for your final image, final stack. And even something like how long should I expose is something that is difficult to find out. There's a lot of logic behind it that involves mostly the read noise of your sensor. It's really a lot of challenges, but with all of those challenges, we have solutions. So for focusing, we have stuff like called bad enough masks, or we have uh, autofocusers that can help. For tracking, we have techniques called auto guiding, where we have a system that tracks a star and will tell your tracker to move faster or slower to really keep the star so it doesn't trail in your final image. And there's other systems available like plate solving that can basically find targets for you uh, rather than you having to manually find those targets. That will be something difficult as well at first. It's very challenging, tons of solutions, tons of things to learn. And it's like the reward when you finally get it right. It's, it's incomparable. It's, it, it's an amazing hobby. It's very hard. It can be very frustrating. But when things click, man, is it awesome. At number two, I want to talk about how difficult it is to find creative freedom with astrophotography. Like with normal photography, there's so many ways you can differentiate yourself with your own style compared to other photographers, where it, be it like how do you compose frames, what kind of subjects do you like, um, how, what light do you like the most, how will you uh, frame your subjects, whatever. Uh, this, it's the, these freedoms kind of like disappear with astrophotography because there's not many factors that you can play on when you do deep space astrophotography and sure you can actually take deep space astrophotos and at the same time uh, landscape photogra photography and combine it together in some kind of like HDR and that's that's one thing but otherwise many of the targets that you're going to try to image many other people have imaged those targets before and there's not so much freedom in terms of how you compose your targets. Like most of the time, you'll be trying to center the targets. Or if you try to do some interesting composition, or maybe even a mosaic of frame to, to really create a, an interesting composition, you might find that it's just been done before and the targets themselves, they don't change. Everyone takes the same pictures effectively. Um, and there are some ways where you can show your creative freedom and it's Sure, there is composition. You can have really interesting compositions for targets that are not really seen before. It's more difficult than with normal photography. But the processing is where you can really change things. Um, like, how do you process your image? How do you make things pop in your image? How much contrast do you apply to it? it we have the same in normal photography, but this, it becomes even more important in astrophotography and especially if you're doing narrowband imaging which is uh, basically what the Hubble telescope does for its nebula pictures most of the time uh, you can play with the actual colors of the image to get very distinct color palettes for the same target uh, from like that are completely different than other photographers so there's a bit of freedom that can be achieved there but it's much reduced from normal photography and I think like it, it can be really um, disconcerting when you first start the hobby to find how you can differentiate yourself and also like what is the meaning of taking those pictures that everyone else has already taken in the past it's something to think about and now we come to number one and uh, number one is an important one because basically the playing field is very, very far from level in astrophotography. In normal photography, someone can take amazing pictures with a smartphone. Um, it's a bit more difficult in astrophotography. And there's really two things that are important uh, with astrophotography. And the first one is light pollution. So light pollution is just like the amount of light from the city around you that makes its way into the sky and propagates into the sky. And it really creates a veil of light that 
hide the targets that are super faint to start with, but that hide them from you trying to image them. It inserts shot noise from the light pollution into your images. It's very, very difficult to deal with. And for instance, I live in Tokyo, so I have a very high level of light pollution. And compared to someone who's like in American suburbs, kind of like far away from the city, I probably need to image 20 times, 30 times longer to be able to get the same result. It's really something that, that is very difficult to deal with. And if you are in a big city, you'll find yourself wanting to um, move <laughs> or at least travel to dark site locations because when you take pictures from dark site locations, immediately everything about the hobby becomes easier. And there's something similar about the amount of money that can be invested in the hobby. You can take amazing pictures with very low budget equipment that are just as good as the pictures of people with equipment worth 10 times what you have, but typically you'll need to spend a lot more effort and there will be a lot more frustration in using that cheap equipment that you have because there are limitations. A cooled camera will always be easier to deal with than a DSLR. A very expensive mount that tracks the stars very precisely will always be easier to deal with than a very cheap mount that you really need to babysit. You can get excellent pictures, but it's really, really uh, difficult and uh, effort intensive to really match the images of those who have more expensive equipment and who live in darker locations than you do. The playing field is really, really uneven and more so than with standard photography. Um, and that is something that, that surprised me at first. I mean, I, I kind of was aware of it, but it is something you really want to take into account. If you live in a dark area, things will be so much more easy for you than for a lot of other people. And that is pretty much all that I wanted to let you know before you go down that slippery path to the hobby. It's an amazing hobby, but yeah, now you know. <laughs> And with that, thank you so much for watching as always. Um, and if you like this video, if you like astronomy, astrophotography in general, feel free to go down below, click that subscribe button, click that bell icon, leave a comment, leave a like or a dislike to tell the YouTube algorithm about this uh, video. And a big thank you to my Patreon and YouTube member uh, supporters. It really, really helps uh, the channel out. So thank you so much. Uh, but as always, the most important is whenever you can, to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.